choir for, for getting us started. I want to welcome you to First United Methodist Church Midlothian. I'm Pastor Brady Johnson. This is Pastor April Thaler. Uh, we're so glad to, to get to share this service with you today. Uh, we decided to coordinate with our suit colors today, so that's just uh, not something that happens every Sunday, so better, be, better watch out. That's going to tell you about something today. Um, but we're, we're so glad we're here today. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're just so thankful that we get to be the community of God's people today, uh, which is just a true gift to us. Um, as we continue our worship uh, this morning, I played a song in here to kind of just get ready for the day. It's one I, I, I like a lot to just, you know, you, you have your pump up stuff, like the Cowboys. Hopefully tomorrow we'll have something to, to get them ready for the game. So I've listened to a song, and it's by Kim Walker-Smith, and she says something really interesting and provides, I think, a great context for what we do when we gather as God's people to praise him and to pray. And she says this about praise. She says she calls it the sounds of heaven touching earth. Uh, and we think about that up in, up in the presence of God, how the, the praises of God will ring out in the heavens and how we get to, to taste that here today. We get to practice that life here today as we sing and we proclaim the goodness of God and we express our gratitude and love for God through, through song and through prayer. And so with that spirit, let's, let's stand and let's sing together. And good morning to you. If you will join me this morning and sing with me, Alas, and did my Savior bleed at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light, where the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I receive my sight, and now, what is it? I'm I am happy all the day. day. Sing with me this morning.
real quick little story, not real quick, but oh, I don't. Growing up as a Baptist preacher's daughter, yes I did, in a little country church, this next song that we're going to sing was almost an every other week song because my dad loved it. And he was the pastor and I was the pianist and my older brother was the worship director. You see where I'm going? So we got to do whatever we wanted to and we did this song a lot. I love this song. Please join me this morning as we sing about that old rugged cross. from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen.
invite our ushers to come forward, and will you join me in prayer? Father, for the gift of life that you have given us through your Son, through the encouragement and continued connection to you through your Holy Spirit, God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that we are here. We give you thanks for every blessing in our life. For we're reminded of James chapter 1, verse 17 that tells us, For every good and perfect gift comes from above. It is but an extension of your grace that we might know the power of your love that claims us. And so we come just thanking you and praising you because you're worthy of the praise that we give. And we give you not only our praises, God, we give you so much more. You hear as we, we come to this time where we place our, our financial treasures here in the plate, it's representative of more than just a portion of our money. It's representative of every blessing and just the gift of ourselves in service to you. For being a part of your purposes in the world brings us so much joy as we know that you are currently about the work of restoring this world. And you're working through the ministry of the church to do that, to see lives changed for the good news of Jesus. And so we come to give out of gratitude and out of love for you. In the name and your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we are in your debt. You are the constant giver of grace. You are the mover of mountains. You are the one that taught us forgiveness. Was willing to sacrifice your son for us. We are people who are grateful to you. 
because we know that in every step in this life that we need you. Not just in the happy times in terms of praises and the darker times as well. We seek you with all that we have. We are opening our hearts to you so that you may dwell within them constantly. We are opening our minds to you so that all that we hear and do and think about can be saturated with your grace. You are the giver of great opportunity. So patient, so kind, so willing to give us another chance. There is so much we can learn from you. But sometimes it just starts at admitting the need that we have for you. A need to be closer a need for you to listen. We know as your children that we have to do everything we can to invite you in. That the world that we live in and, and sometimes the world we create around us can prevent you from being with us. because we can become less receptive to all that you have to give. Sometimes we need you to get up, just to be able to get up in the morning on the difficult days, the days that we may wake up in pain or, or in loss or in grief. There are so many different ways to invite you in. We have to remember to do that, to call you into our circumstances, to praise you, to love you, and to learn from you and your people. And even if it means we must go down on our knees just to be thankful for all that we have, and all that you have given to us and all that we know you will continue to give to us because it's who you are. For so many of us, it's we forget to ask you to come in. That in the middle of, of being disciples, we forget to invite you into all that we do. And we're the examples that are set. And people are watching. Give us the strength and the courage to continue to invite you in. To continue um, to love you in ways that we've never loved you before. So that we may grow even closer to you in this moment. We thank you for the, the space that you have created around us. It's a space that only you, know, you and we can share one at a time. You make room for us here on earth as well as in heaven. So that we can spend time alone with you. Getting to appreciate you. And I love you even more. We know as disciples it is difficult for us to stay on track. We know that in, in many spaces the disciples were accused for not having enough faith, for not doing what they should do, and not submitting to you and all of these things. It takes practice. And it's in these times that we are learning to, to guide ourselves in different ways that we think we might get lost off this path, which is why Jesus, 
taught us a prayer so that we can remain going in the right direction. And that prayer is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I really start looking at the order. All right, like I thought there was special music going on here, so uh, I was going to wait for somebody else to start. So uh, I guess it's my turn, all right? <laughs> uh, if you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to, to bring your Bible to worship always. If you, uh, there are Bibles in the pew, it's just they're not the version we read from, but you're welcome to, to grab one of those if you need it. If you are a member, you come here regularly, bring your Bible to church. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, there's no substitute for your own Bible and the familiarity you get from just looking in, in your Bible. And so if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 22. And so just put your thumb there. We'll get there in just a moment. So uh, one of the, the stories, I think, from Scripture that we always find really fascinating uh, and, and sometimes really confusing is the story of Jesus' call of the first disciples. If you know what I'm talking about, it's in Matthew chapter 4, at least that's when Matthew talks about the story. It tells us that Jesus was kind of strolling along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Peter and Andrew casting their nets into the sea. And Jesus stops and he looks at them and he says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And Matthew says them, they, they dropped their nets at once. They, they dropped their nets, and they followed him. And, and right on the heels of that story, like the, the next verse, it, this might have even been in the same stroll. Jesus is strolling along, and then he sees James, brothers James and John uh, cleaning their nets. They'd just gotten through fishing. They were fishermen just like Peter and Andrew. And Jesus says the same thing to them, come and follow me. And, and Matthew says that they left their nets immediately to follow Jesus. Like what? Y you know, like we, we hear that story and we're like, that's great, but really? Like, that's it? You, you know, and, and you read this and like, I don't know about you, but I read this and I think, man, what would, I, what would I have done? Like if I'm one of those guys going about my normal day with my, my trajectory that I have in mind for my life and my, my plans and this like, comfortable plan. I mean, for, many, for, you know, for James and John, it was a family business. That's what they were going to inherit from their dad. And, and with all these things in mind, would, would I have been willing to leave those things behind to follow Jesus? I mean, what would you have done? Like, don't you wonder that when we read this story? Like, what would we have done? Would we have been willing to, to leave behind what was comfortable, what was known for us, to embrace it for this, this unknown but, but life of adventure with Jesus? I mean, I don't know that we can know the answer to that question, but it just, man, it always looms in my mind when I encounter that. And I bring that story up because it kind of leads us into to a kind of way of understanding our scripture today in Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. And, and before we read this scripture, I want to kind of put this story into the kind of greater context of what's happening here in this section of Matthew. 
So, so if you know much about the Gospels, you know oftentimes there is, of course, a greater theme across the Gospel. And then oftentimes there are kind of portions where, where a section of the Scripture will be used to make sure that the audience knows a message, that the message is clear when you read it or, or hear the story told. Well, there's a section of Scripture in Matthew 8 and 9 where there is a concentration of stories about Jesus performing miracles. Uh, in fact, there's 10 stories, 10 miracle stories in just two chapters. You read Matthew 8 and 9, like every story is a story about Jesus performing a miracle. But, but somehow, like wedged in the middle of all these miracle stories is a story about discipleship. And and this isn't just random. I I think there's something significant about why Matthew kind of puts this story in the middle of of all of these miracle stories. And and here's what I think the significance is. Uh, The miracle stories tell us that that Jesus is, is worthy of our submitting to his power and authority. Like if one thing happens when you read the story, these miracles of Jesus, they they tell us that Jesus has power and authority. If you want to, after this, you can read Matthew 8 and 9, and man, it'll just tell you. It'll say, you know, look, man, fever will submit to the power and authority of Jesus. Skin disease will submit to the power and the authority of Jesus. Storms will submit to the power and authority of Jesus. Sickness, paralysis, like, like everything that Jesus, any kind of suffering that he encounters... Like, all of it just submits to the authority of Jesus. And that's what the miracle stories tell us. But this story on discipleship asks a different question. And the question it asks of us in the middle of this message of the power and the authority of Jesus, it asks, will you? Like, will you submit to the power and authority of Jesus? I mean, sure, the sickness does. Sure, the suffering does. The the paralysis, the skin diseases, the storms. Like, yes, they submit to Jesus. They have to. They don't have a choice. Like, they have no, no ability to do anything but to bend to the will and the power of Jesus. But here's the thing. You do. You have the choice of saying, yes, Jesus, I see your power and authority, and I'm, and I'm willing to place my life under it, or you can walk away. And, and, and this passage, man, it gives us just, I think, a great definition of what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who on the front end of their life just submits to the power and the authority of Jesus for their life. And that's where discipleship begins. It begins with with submitting to the authority and power of Jesus. And what the miracle stories tell us, they tell us that Jesus is worthy of our submitting to his power and authority. But this this story you're about to read about these two would-be disciples is, is, is the question that they face, is the same question that we face, is will you? Will you follow Jesus? And, and so let's go ahead and look at, at Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. And in fact, we're actually just going to read the first uh, two verses here. Three, 18 through 20. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, 18 through 20. And we'll read the story about the first, uh, the first encounter he has with a would-be disciple. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake, meaning the Sea of Galilee. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied to him, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And and just like that, Jesus pops his balloon. Like a little kid in the store who's excited about their balloon, Jesus kind of pops his balloon a little bit, you know. Um, There's this excitement in following him, and Jesus kind of brings him back down to reality. And and we look at this story, and we're going to look at the same thing. And if you're confused about this one, you're going to be even more confused about the next one. So there's just a kind of warning. Um, But but we look at this story, and and we have some questions about it. And I want to just preface both of them 
to say that we're really not given just a lot of information about either of these would-be disciples. Like if we were writing this story, there's more things we would like to know about their heart and their intention behind what they say and why Jesus responds to them the way that, that, that he does. We'd love to know more about the circumstances around their life, but we only know what we know. <laughs> and so ultimately, we're going to have to go with that. We can wonder a little bit, but we're going to kind of go with what's said. And when we look at this encounter with, with this teacher of the law that Jesus has, we know the point that Jesus makes. And and the point is fairly clear. What Jesus is saying is, hey, there's a cost to following me. There is a cost to following me. That's great that you want to follow me, but you just need to know, like, there's a cost to following me. And, again, we can't know for sure, but, but I think this is why he gets this response from Jesus. Teachers of the law in their day were very well respected in their community. They were well thought of. They were were given this kind of place of of authority in the community. Uh, They knew a lot about something that the community was interested in, but maybe wasn't nearly as well versed in. So they were often given these places to teach and speak into the life of the community. We know they were often given these number of privileges and, and invitation to kind of experience finer things. Um, and, and if a teacher of the law would attach themselves to a kind of master teacher, then they stood to gain even more. Like they would get invited to the, the, the parties, you know, not just like a party, but the, but the parties, the parties everybody wanted to get to. They get invited to those and they would also get the seat of honor next to their master teacher. Like you got to be part of the entourage and everybody kind of envied your access to this person. And that happened often in in first century Judaism. That's what discipleship looked like for them. And so we knew that, that this guy, this teacher of the law, was probably enjoyed some of these things and was probably looking at Jesus and thinking, man, I'm going to get even more of those kind of things. Like That could be kind of a draw for him to want to follow Jesus. And so Jesus' message to him is clear. It doesn't look like that when you follow me. <laughs> like if that's the draw and, and you want more authority, you want to be welcomed by everybody in the community, you want the invitation to the parties, it doesn't look like that when you follow me. And Jesus says, there's a cost when you follow me. And and I think this message is is one that is so important for us to visit. Because I I think the church in America has so long kind of peddled, but but kind of unintentionally peddled this message that that you can follow Jesus without a real cost to your life. You know, the church has kind of taken a cue from, from the other companies in our culture that, that tend to, to, to tell you all the great things that you're going to get when you purchase their product. And we lead with like, hey, come on in. You're going to get eternal life and there's hope and joy and, and it's this amazing life that you get. And that's really the only story that we tell. That's really the only story we tell is all the great things you're going to get when you, when you come on to the other side. And we never talk at all about a cost. And what's interesting is that Jesus always talked about the cost. I mean, he invited them to come and experience. He told them there's some great things in store. But, but man, the, the retirement package isn't for this life. There's some joy and there's some hope, and you're going to get experience some amazing things if you follow me here. Don't tell me, I mean, I'm not, don't get me wrong, it's going to be amazing for you, but man, th- that package of, of nothing but blessing, that's for the life to come. Uh, and, and, and we often just don't, we're not honest about the cost, like Jesus is honest about the cost. And, and the result is what happens is you get people who come in to the church, they come in to become a, a Christian, and, and they're ready to follow Jesus and the blessing, but they're not so sure when it comes to cost them something. And, and what you end up having is a number of people in our churches who believe in Jesus, but they're just not sure about following him. And, and biblically, that's not discipleship. It's just not. And this idea that we can just believe in Jesus and everything is great and, and not really follow him and not really trust him as Lord and not really walk in his ways and, and seek to be shaped by his life. 
that doesn't exist here. If we've gotten that message, then it's, it's a message that's gotten twisted somehow, somewhere, in, in a church or, or, or wherever. But, man, if you bind a discipleship without a cost, all it does is kind of, and we probably know if you've, you've been in that place in your life, it puts you in that, like, weird situation. Have you ever, like, been dating somebody and you weren't sure if you're, like, really dating? Like, you've hung out a few times, but, like, you have no idea, like, what's really happening here? Like, neither one really knows what's going on. Like, if you, if you believe in Jesus, but you're not following him, like, it kind of puts you in that place. You're, like, halfway in relationship, halfway out. No one really knows. But the reality is there's a cost to discipleship, and we, there's a giving ourselves over in discipleship. That's what it means. Because discipleship is ultimately about our willingness to submit to the power and authority of Jesus in our life. And just to put that in really simple terms for us on a day-to-day life, what that looks like is it means giving over control of your life. It, it, means, it means you choose to stop being Lord of your own life. Like, how scary does that sound? <laughs> like, I, I choose to quit directing me. I quit to, to, to just choose to... To, to make my dreams the only thing that I pursue, my wants and my wishes. Like, like to say, Jesus, I want to follow you means I'm willing to let you step into that place, Lord. I'm willing to let your desires begin to shape and influence my desires. I start to seek your way before I start to pursue my way. I want your purpose to infuse this life that you've given, not for me to exert my own purpose in this world. And, and that's what discipleship means. And, and if you do that, as scary as that may sound for us, and it probably sounds scary to every one of us, even those who, who, who are in the midst of having done that and living that out, what it means is you're going to experience some amazing blessings in following Jesus. But it also means you're going to follow some hard, you're going to find some hardships in your life. If you really do it, if you really follow Jesus, you're going to run into some obstacles and challenges. It's just going to happen. And a great example of this comes actually in the stories that bookend Matthew 8, 18 through 22. It's actually just a continuation of the story. We just don't have time to read all of them. But when you look at the story um, before this, you see uh, Jesus is at Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law gets really sick. And, and so what Jesus does is, is he heals her. And we know that there are a number of people at the house who see this amazing thing of Jesus heal his mother-in-law who's about to die. And, and, and they, they leave, these people leave, and they go, and they grab their loved ones who are sick. And they start bringing their loved ones to Jesus, and Jesus is like touching them and healing them. He's speaking over them and healing them. And it's this incredible scene. I mean, just imagine for a moment what it would be like to be at this house and just to watch people and coming down the alley, coming through the doors with these people who can't walk, these people who can't speak, these people who are just you know, crippled by the sickness in their life, and Jesus just frees them. And this brokenness is just transformed into wholeness. I just I don't know if you can begin to imagine that, but how wonderful would it be to experience something like that? And, and no wonder this teacher of the law said, sign me up for that. Like, I, I want to see that every day. Like, that would be incredible to be a part of, of these miracles. Like, who doesn't want to experience that? But look at the story that follows beginning in verse 23. Jesus calls the disciples to get into the boat to go across the Sea of Galilee. And what do they face? A storm. And in just a few minutes, all of a sudden, waves are crashing into their boat. And, and this joy and this freedom and this amazing thing they just experienced, I mean, just like hours before, all of a sudden, all that's into question. Their life is into question. And they can't even see the next moments in their life. And they're terrified. And that's a great summation of what it looks like to follow Jesus. You'll get to experience some amazing things, and then there are going to be some challenging things. And what Jesus says is, hey, that's what it looks like to follow me. And you better count the cost and be willing to go through the storms and not just be in it for the miracles. You'll get to experience those. You, you absolutely will. And it's worth it. I mean, if you get to be a part of those things, it is so worth it. But you got to be willing to go with me in the storms, too. 
And so what Jesus says to the teacher of the law is, man, you can follow me, just count the cost. Know that at times in following me, you're not going to be welcomed by everybody. You might be rejected. You might be ostracized. Whatever challenge it might be, those will come to you. It's worth it. It's so worth it. Just know that there's a cost and be willing to pay. And for some of us, we, we need to hear that today. And so let's look at um, would-be disciple number two. In verse 21 and 22, we find uh, well, someone who doesn't have names, another disciple. Uh, it says, another disciple said to Jesus, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Ouch. <laughs> like if you, if you chalk up the hard sayings of Jesus that we don't like, this will be in that list. Um, the chances are, if you've heard this preached on, you've heard it, a preacher try and make this more palatable. <laughs> uh, there's a temptation, believe me, every time you face it, to go like, surely Jesus wasn't that harsh with the guy, you know? Uh, and, and let me tell you, again, this is one of those cases we don't know all the circumstances surrounding this. There could be a number of things of what bury your father means, and we, we really don't know uh, we really only know what we know, but but here let me let me tell you, um, Jesus is not advocating that you abdicate your responsibility to care for your family. And and here's how we know that because in Matthew chapter 15, when Jesus confronts the scribes and the teachers of the law about their practices of injustice, one of the first things that he names is he says, "You do not care for your father and your mother." So, so Jesus isn't saying, don't care for your family. He's saying something else. We're just not really sure exactly <laughs> what it is. Uh, and and I, I think what we find here, and, and here's what I think as I, as I wrestle with this, of what might be going on. Um, we, we know that, that actually it was a great responsibility to care for your father and your mother in the Hebrew culture here. It was actually based on the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother, which is actually the first commandment of the human responsibility, part of the Ten Commandments. First four are your responsibility to God. The last six are your responsibility to your fellow relationships of what it looks like to love your neighbor. So honor your father and mother is the first of those commandments. And it was really important for people to care for their family, their fathers and mothers in the, in the Israelite culture. We also know that, that over time, that began to be the most important task, and it began to supersede just about every form of religious devotion that the Hebrews practiced. We know it even eclipsed the, the daily reciting of the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, what every Israelite was commanded and expected to recite several times a day, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And, and that was really a way of saying, God, we, we remember today who you are so that we can remember who we are. And, and that was the foundation of your identity and your life as, as, as a Jew. And, and so we know that the, the call to care for your father and mother at, at a point, and maybe around Jesus' time, meant you didn't have to do anything religiously. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to go to temple. You didn't have to worry. You didn't do anything. Like it's an excuse to get out of everything. And, and I think what Jesus is maybe doing here is he's using hyperbole to get your attention because this definitely gets our attention. And, and he's doing this to really test um, our allegiance and our priorities. Uh, again, I, I don't really know because we only know what we can read here. So we don't know the circumstances. We don't know the guy's heart or the exact situation. But we do know something from this text. And, and it's at face value. And so we're just going to take it at that and set some of our questions about this aside a little bit, if you can work with me on that one. And, and, and what we do know about this is that this guy had something standing in the way of his following Jesus. Like there was something, some obstacle that stood in the way of him saying, yes to Jesus, I will follow you. 
And there was some excuse that just came up that, that prevented him from taking that next step and getting in the boat. And, and I have to wonder, is there something getting in the way of you following Jesus? Like, is there some excuse that, that keeps coming up in your life when you consider truly submitting everything that you are to the authority and the power of Jesus for your life? Like, it could be some kind of fear or, or lack of trust. It could be some kind of sin that becomes an obstacle in our life that just keeps us from saying yes because we can't say no to that. For a lot of us, and the one that I, I hear probably most and have said most in my life is like, well, it's just not the time. <laughs> I, got, I got things going on right now, you know? Like, I, I, I've got things going on at work. I've got things going on at home. And, and I just I can't, I can't step into anything different than what I'm doing. And that, for a lot of us, in the fast-paced world that we're in, we feel like we can't fit anything else and that there's nothing else that can come in. And we often see discipleship really kind of as, as one or the other. I have to follow Jesus and leave everything or go on about my life. When really, I think discipleship is often how we go about the life God is calling us to live with that purpose. But, but we look at this and we say, I've got a season, and a season. I've I got to get beyond the season to another season, and then I can follow. But let me tell you something. And I'm not telling you something you don't already know. I just am here to be accountable for us being honest with each other. There's always going to be something in the way. There's always going to be something in the way. Like it's never going to be an easy time. It's just not. There's always going to be something going on at work. There's always going to be something going on with your family. There's always going to be those, those tests at school that you've got to take. Like, it will never be convenient to follow Jesus. It's just a reality of life. But the danger I think we live in so often is, is that we are always in danger of letting lesser things keep us from living out the greater thing. I think that's one of the, the dangers of, of living in the, the, the fast-paced culture that tries to cram so much into our life is that it's so easy for us to let lesser purposes keep us from living the greater purpose, for lesser things to derail us living out our greater purpose. Um, today I was working through my sermon, and um, believe it or not, I practiced this thing. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I thought about, for some reason, this like vision. I said derail, and I was like, ooh, derail. And I thought, well, I wonder like what it would take to derail a train. Like I don't know if you know, but a locomotive weighs average about 220 tons. That's a lot. Uh, an average train that, that travels the tracks in America weighs 4,000 tons. If you can just imagine that, moves it with 50 miles an hour five when it goes through Midlothian, you know, like uh, either, either one. But like you can just imagine, you know, 4,000 tons, you know, moving at 50 miles an hour. What would it take to move that train off the tracks? Well, actually, Union Pacific and other companies, they, they have something for that. They call it a wedge. It just weighs, it's made of steel. They can put it on the tracks, and it weighs just a couple hundred pounds. And when a train hits it, it knocks the wheels off the track, and the train just and I feel like for so many of us, man, we have like this little thing. Maybe it's a big thing, but, but for those of us who are wrestling with like really truly just fully giving ourselves to Jesus and saying, hey, my life is yours. What are you calling me to every day? Like it's just like this little thing that, that's, that's keeping us from this big and beautiful and wonderful purpose. And I just have to ask you, like, like what's the thing? Like, what's the thing that's in the way? And we, we, look, we look at these stories in Matthew 8, and they're, they're beautiful, they're powerful, they're, I, I don't know, maybe we don't want to look at them, like they're, they're tough, they're, they're hard. Um, we look at these, and, and there's a lot of unanswered questions we have, and I think one of the struggles we have when we look at these is we go, well, there's not resolution. <laughs> like, we don't know if they got in the boat or if they didn't get in the boat. And we don't know what happened to the teacher of the law and, and to the other disciple, did they follow Jesus? And Matthew really doesn't tell us that. 
And I think there's some purpose behind that. Because here's a reality that happens when you look at this passage and you read it over and over again. You begin to realize um, that you are the teacher of the law. That you are the other disciple. And, 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 and you're often, and we are often the ones who, who want to follow Jesus, but we're just not so sure about the cost. Like, we're the ones who want to follow Jesus, but somehow there's something that keeps getting in the way. Like, it's not just their story. It's your story, and it's my story. But here's the beautiful thing about this, is just like this story doesn't have the ending, that Matthew doesn't tell us that, uh, yours hasn't been written either. And you have the chance today to either keep writing the story of your, your living out discipleship to Jesus, of your being submitted to his power and authority and, and living out his purposes for your life and growing in that. Or, or maybe you, you rewrite the story by saying, okay, I haven't. I've, something's kept me, but I'm willing to do it now. I'm willing to throw it all off, and I'm willing to follow Jesus today without reservation, without this thing that, that, that's going to get in my way. Like you have the chance to finish your story today. And, and that's going to be our prayer as we start to come to a close in the service. Um, yeah, I thought this week just we ought to do something different as we're thinking about our commitment. We're in a series talking about purpose, and, and we've actually the first two weeks started with just the beginning points of our identity. And, and here we're just talking about, you know, our, our submitting to Jesus as disciples and, and I thought back to last week when we read the story of Jesus' baptism, if you were here. And we talked about how Jesus was baptized as a way of showing his commitment to the Father. I'm committed, God, to your purposes. It was a way of yielding his will and his life to him. And so I thought about this week, what if we came down, for those of us who have been baptized and who want to commit ourselves again. Maybe it's a recommitment of your life to follow Jesus. Maybe uh, this is your commitment for the first time, to, to let something down. You believed in Jesus, but you, you've been unsure about really following him. If you've been baptized before, we're going to have a, a time where you can come and have your baptism remembered. You can come down. We'll, we'll, Pastor April and I will we'll dip our finger in the water. We'll put a sign of a cross on your forehead, and we'll say, remember your baptism and be thankful. And it's a way of you saying, Jesus, I want now to commit to your purpose. I want to give myself again. Because you know what? Sometimes, sometimes we're those disciples who drop our nets and then pick them back up again. <laughs> like that's the reality of discipleship. Sometimes we leave them for good, and that's some people's story. And some people, we drop them, and we take a step, and we go, mm, I don't know. And we, we go back to them. Like that's sometimes our life. And maybe you need to say, I, I give myself again to you today. Uh, or maybe you've never done this, and you have never really fully given yourself to Jesus, maybe you've never expressed a belief in Jesus, and maybe you've never been baptized, and today you're thinking, this is a great day to start. Maybe I need to give my life to Jesus to make him Lord of my life. You can do that today, too, and, and we're going to have a prayer in just a moment. We'll invite all who want to remember up and, and those who want to even be baptized, and, and if you want to be baptized, just tell me or April when we're here. Um, and we'll have you kind of stand off to the side so that we can do that once everybody else has remembered their baptism. And we'll do your baptism here now and celebrate the new life of Jesus that, and, and what baptism means as we commit ourselves to him. Um, but as we get ready for this, I, I want you to just bow and let's pray and ask God to speak and to make this a word for, for you. And the Holy Spirit, we are so thankful that you come to speak to us and to speak into our life. We're even grateful for passages like this that just challenge us. Oh, man, they challenge us to consider our commitment to you and, and our willingness to follow you. Um, you know, Lord, whether or not there is, uh, we have refused to count the cost, whether we are fully in or, or just partially committed only for the good. You know if there's something standing in the way. And we pray that you speak and reveal in our hearts and our lives what we need to hear from you so that we can, like, like Peter and Andrew and James and John, man, drop our nets for this life of adventure in following you and knowing you. That we would be so committed that it would see us into the miracles and even through the storms, that we would just be ready and willing to give ourselves to the greater purpose which is yours. 
And for every person who comes forward today to remember their baptism, may these waters, may they bless them. May you speak through and move through the waters, through your Holy Spirit. May it, may it give them a fresh helping of your grace to see them through in their commitment to you. For those who've never been touched by the waters of baptism, who've never given you the place of Lord of their life, may these waters represent the new life with you, Jesus. A death to the old life and a resurrection into the new. We pray this through the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, we'll invite you to come. If you want to remember your baptism or, or be baptized, again, you'll come down the center aisle. Um, you can, after you remember your baptism, um, pray here and then go back to your seat through the outside aisle. Again, if you want to be baptized today, we'll do that. Uh, we're, we're, we're here. We're in it for you. Uh, we'd love for you to be and just we'll, we'll hold you off to the side and we'll do that after we remember people's baptisms. But let's respond uh, to the Holy Spirit who speaks to us today.
Just a couple of uh, announcements in front of you. Uh, we have Wednesday at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. We'll have our prayer service. So if you want to come and just pray, it's, uh, we just pray. That's why we call it the prayer service. We just pray. So you're, you're welcome to come. We'd love to have you. Just a time to pray and bring our needs before God, bring our church before God, um, and pray for our community. So we'd love for you to come and be a part of that. And you don't have to pray out loud if you don't want to, but uh, we just come. It's going to be, a, it's always a great service. Uh, we have coming up an important date. Uh, we have been going through this kind of process considering disaffiliation uh, from the United Methodist Church. We have our charge conference date, which will be February 9th. That's a Thursday night, uh, beginning at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center. Uh, so if you're a member, you'll get some information um, about pre-registering for that night. Uh, we'll have a number of meetings kind of coming up, some small group opportunities if you still have questions. We'll have a, a, a town hall on February 5th at 5 o'clock in the, in the Family Life Center where we'll eat dinner and just kind of talk about the process a little bit, tell you about what that night's going to look like, and then have communion. So uh, it'll be a pretty simple meeting, but an important one. If you're a member, I'd encourage you to be there on the 5th and then also on the 9th. So, so please be thinking about that. Um, we also have coming up on February 12th is Super Bowl Chili Cook-Off. It's back this year, and we are so excited. Uh, no idea if the Cowboys are going to make it, but it's going to be fun regardless. Um, you'll get to bring a dish, uh, do it during the Sunday school hour. The people over in the By the Well service are going to try and make it through an hour of worship with all this good smelling food in the Family Life Center, and then after our 11 o'clock services, we'll eat. And it's a lot of fun, just a great time of fellowship together, so I encourage you to think about that. Uh, you're a first-time guest. Oh, Bible study is beginning Wednesday, and we have our yeah some Wednesday activities of children and youth uh, Bible study are beginning um, youth and and Bible study beginning 4:30. 4:30 here uh, for April's Bible study. So um, be thinking about that um, as we get ready to leave this place. If you're a guest, uh, we have a, a gift for you in the back. So we'd love to just bless you if you're a first-time guest with us. But as we leave this place, we leave with the challenge, you know, uh, of, of truly trusting Jesus and, and, in, and giving ourselves to him, submitting to him that Jesus might be able to live and minister and heal and do wonderful things through us. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing with me.